Welcome, folks. Thank you all for coming again. Um, regard, as you know, today is October 3rd, so this afternoon I'll be posting the next assignment. You'll have a whole week to do it. It'll be very manageable. <coughs> the instructions will be very clear. Um, it'll be about comparing the design approaches of two of our uh, guests. And uh, you'll see that all, it'll all be very clear in the email um, and on the assignment. So please pay attention to that. Don't let it, uh, don't let it slip. Um, I am absolutely delighted today to have as our guest Kent Larson. Kent directs uh, the Media Lab's Changing Places group. Since 1998, he has also directed the MIT N, the MIT House N Research Consortium in the School of Architecture and Planning. He, his current research is focused on four related areas. Responsive urban housing, new urban vehicles, ubiquitous technologies, and living lab experiments. Larson practiced architecture for 15 years in New York City with work published in Architectural Record, Pro Progressive Architecture, Global Architecture, The New York Times, A Plus U, and Architectural Digest. His book, Louis I. Kahn, Unbuilt Masterworks, was selected as one of the 10 best books in architecture in 2000 by the New York Times Review of Books. Related work was selected by Time Magazine as Best Design of the Year project. I'd like to add also that um, Kent is associated with a very, the, the very interesting enterprise at MIT that we call the Media Lab, which is part of the School of Architecture and Planning and one of the most innovative academic centers in the United States and indeed the world. Um, and although he's going to talk about more than uh, the city car project, the, the sort of overarching rationale for having Kent bookend Henrik Fisker, our earlier guest, is to perhaps help you all understand the broad range of questions that something as specific as the design of cars uh, can involve. So with that, please join me in welcoming Kent Larson. Thank you. Thanks very much. So thank you. It's great to be here. I'm, um, I'm going to start by talking about cities, because we um, just recently started what we call the City Science in Initiative. I'll just mention that the Media Lab has 27 research groups. I have one, but this Cities Initiative is a group of groups. So we actually now have five groups that are collaborating on it. I'm, I'm directing it. Uh, and uh, we're having a lot of fun. Uh, and we get to travel a lot, see a lot of cities, and see a lot of problems. So what, what, what are some of the problems? This is probably the biggest problem that, you've, that you uh, run across if you go to Latin America or India or, uh, or China. Uh, I took this from a taxi cab on a really good day. You see that's green and yellow up there? There's no red. So this is, this is the experience in Beijing. Uh, and, and, the, and the reason I think we're getting into this the, these kind of problems is we're, frankly, not designing cities for people, we're designing them for machines. That's why you have the sprawl of Los Angeles, uh, Mexico City, Riyadh, took this out of my hotel in Riyadh a couple of months ago, just goes on forever. You, in, in China, you, you see tower sprawl, but it's effectively the same thing. We have tremendous amounts of land that's, that is wasted to the storage of cars. Everything red there is a parking lot or a parking deck in Houston. And, and actually, we were looking at Kendall Square just yesterday. It's almost as bad. Uh, <clears throat> you find extraordinary pollution in China. I took this again out my window uh, of a hotel in Shanghai on an otherwise clear day when they were canceling flights because of limited visibility. And Shanghai was, was terrific air quality compared to Beijing on that day. You, you find uh, these new superblock developments in China that I think of as ghettos because they are single purpose, uh, isolated, uh, sort of monocultures. I mean, there's nowhere to buy a toothbrush in that complex. And I think totally dysfunctional, totally dependent on the private automobile. 
Um, we've been thinking a lot about density because I think in some ways density is key. Uh, who knows what this is, where this is? Paris is, you know, most people, you know, have Paris on their list of their favorite places. In, in some sense, this is my image of the city of the future in that it's designed for people. It's very high density there in the, in the six arrondissements. There's over 22,000 people per square kilometer. And you, in Paris, you have a lot of the good things that, that come with density without the bad things in a city like Bangalore, which is actually uh, lower density in most areas. Uh, it, it's interesting, if you, if you begin to look at density uh, or the size of cities, you find that good things track pretty carefully with bad things. So if you look at this, this is po whoops, sorry, population, population on the horizontal scale. Um, and you find that uh, as population increases, you have an increase in GDP, research and development patents, but you also have an increase in AIDS cases and crimes and many other things. Cities uh, that have particularly dense urban cores tend to have a lot of very good things. They tend to have more skilled people, higher wages, greater innovation, more science and technology companies, organizations in the arts, very much lower water and, and energy consumption per capita, but if you don't do it right, density also comes with increased noise, congestion, pollution, loss of contact with nature, crime, drug use, disease. This, this is uh, an interesting study. I think the numbers are a little bogus, but I think the point makes sense in that you have, in this case, uh, livability rated with some real metrics on this horizontal scale, urban density vertically. And you can see that it, there's not a direct relationship between livability and density. It was a Singapore study, by the way, so they're, of course, up there as the most livable high density city. But again, I think we, what we're searching for in our research are these strategies that allow you to have the good stuff with density without, without all the bad stuff. So we've developed a whole series of uh, what we think of as solutions or urban innovations that will allow that to happen. So the number one thing, we, you design neighborhoods. You don't design cities. You design, you, you design neighborhoods that get nested together and you make sure that you um, have a, a, a mix of amenities such that essentially everything that everyone needs in life is within a 20 minute walk. Uh, probably should even be less than that. You see this, uh, you see, you see a, a, this 20 minute walk pattern all over the world. If you fly over Germany or India, you see a series of villages. They're all roughly a mile, mile and a half apart because it's, it, they're designed um, for walking for people, and, and the fields are farther apart. It's not really workable for um, for the farmers. If you look at medieval cities, you see a really interesting pattern. Quite often, like this, you have an inner core that's that's uh, a little bit higher density. You have a uh, an outer ring that's protected, uh, maybe a little bit less density, and then you have all the food production uh, adjacent to that. And you can literally find hundreds and hundreds of cities with that same kind of pattern. You can see it in Kendall Square. If you start where I work at uh, Kendall Square and walk to Central Square, Harvard Square, Porter Square, the subway stops are about a mile apart. Each of the centers are about a mile apart. In other words, there's something fundamental about that pattern. You see it in Paris with the 20 arrondissements, okay? And each of these neighborhoods, which were in effect villages, that have come together, they, they have mass transit stops, they have a town center, they have all kinds of uh, very rich amenities. In fact, if you uh, look at the distribution of cafes in Paris, there's almost nowhere in Paris where a cafe is more than a two or three minute walk, and the same applies to shops and physicians and pharmacies. What do they do in China? They say, let's put all the, the hospitals down in this zone, and let's put the housing here, and let's Let's put all the commercial up here and everything is separated and they connect them with roads and make sure that there are at least three parking spaces for every car and that works 
to some extent at a smaller scale, but when you get up into the size of a mega scale, the whole thing, mega city, the whole thing breaks down. So we think that we, we should make cities out of these compact neighborhoods, and the process of making a city is really creating a mesh network. The red lines are mass transit, could be bus or subway or, or uh, light rail. Uh, we, we might take the, the private cars around the perimeter, give them parking at some point at the edge, but make sure that people have alternatives to the private vehicle within each of these neighborhoods. Now we've been modeling now these, these new areas using Legos. They happen to be one of our sponsors, but I've, I've come, to, come to realize that it is a fantastic tool because you can design a city in terms of Lego units. So this is the basic Lego unit that we're using, the smallest little piece. Um, this is 10 meters by 10 meters by one story. We've actually jumped the scale up for a study we're doing in Kendall Square where it's five meters by five meters. And you can map data to that. You can map revenue, activities, uh, people per Lego unit, even vegetables if you're, if you're doing urban farming. Uh, we color code them for our early rapid prototyping. So uh, that little square, uh, if yellow is retail, that could be mapped to two workers per Lego unit in a restaurant or 300 customers per day. Uh, you can rapidly put together sort of pre-architecture uh, functional relationships. And we found it's a fantastic tool because the students can rapidly play with these ideas without getting hung up on, on architectural issues, which really should come later. They're really thinking about data and function and people and relationships. And uh, a workshop we did last term where we, uh, we had four teams, and in one week they had to design a one square kilometer neighborhood for a new city in China called Nansa. And they all used the same number of Lego bricks. And they were, it was a greenfield site along a, along a canal. And you can see the very different um, parties that were developed. Some low density with canals, other put the density in the corners and left uh, half the site natural, et cetera, et cetera. I'll come back to Legos because we're doing some new things with them. Okay. So you build compact urban cells as neighborhoods. The second is what we call mobility on demand. And this is, I think, primarily what George wanted me to talk about. And we define that as where alternatives to the private automobile are more convenient, affordable, and pleasurable, and you essentially eliminate traffic congestion. So who, who knows what this represents? What? Average. It's the average, yeah, it's the average family. In other words, it's the American dream. This is, the, this is what I grew up with. You know, this, this was this idea that you have a perfect family that lives in a single family house and you have two cars and a milkman brings milk and you've got 2.5 kids and all of that. That is all really rapidly breaking down. Um, I, I ha <clears throat> Most of my graduate students, and they tend to be late 20s, early 30s, don't even own a car, and most of them say they don't ever intend to own a car. You guys probably are much in that, that same boat. So um, when I was growing up, the, 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 the number one object that we aspired to was a private car, because that was freedom and status. That's how you got dates. And, and uh, nowadays, it's probably a mobile phone. So ownership is breaking down. This, this infatuation with um, brands is, is breaking down. It's really, we're really moving much more towards a, a service economy or a sharing economy. This was the cover of The Economist magazine from um, a couple of months ago, and it talks exactly about what we've been talking about literally for 10 years. This is now our image of mobility on demand. So you have, uh, you have different modes. The, the uh, upper left mode is the most important one that you design for, which is walking. But then you can have shared bikes. That happens to be Copenhagen, where I was last week, where 52% of the people in Copenhagen travel by, commute by bike every day. It's quite extraordinary. We have, you have shared e-bikes, shared uh, mass transit. We're moving toward, away from fixed rail, fixed 
route mass transit with fixed schedules to more on demand. We think we can have a little three-wheel bike lane vehicle. By the way, the, the vehicles in red are the ones that we have designed in our group. Robo scooter that folds up and the city car. I'll talk about some of these in a minute. But collectively, they make this mobility on demand system where you identify yourself, you take the right vehicle for the right time, for the right trip, and uh, you have access to this whole ecosystem of alternatives to the private car. So this is the robo scooter. This it's a little electric scooter. It folds up. It could be. It's designed to be integrated into something like the Hubway system. You might have an alternative uh, to a conventional bike if you're going a little bit farther. This is the green wheel where you use an electric hub motor and you can convert any bicycle to an electric bike. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in China recently where they have these three wheel vehicles all over the place. Uh, and they're used for utilities and delivery, but they're also used as personal vehicles, particularly for elderly people because they're more stable. And what you tend to find in China is you have um, only poor people using the bike lanes, and they have a lot of bike lanes. Be, and middle class people sitting in traffic in their Audi A6s stalled as the poor people zip by in the bike lanes. And so we thought maybe we should think about how to uh, make it cool to ride in bike lanes, sort of high status. So this is one project we're currently working on, which is a three-wheel electric vehicle. It meets the EU regulations for a bike lane vehicle, which means you have to pedal it, you have light, uh, weight and, and power restrictions. Um, in this case, we've designed it so it can fold up, again, dock with a hubway-like system. Uh, we're actually now designing a standardized platform, so this could even be enclosed and car-like. So in a, an area like Saudi Arabia, it might be air-conditioned with a much bigger battery. We're developing applications uh, to encourage social biking because we found that when people bike together, they're more inclined to switch modes and, and to uh, use uh, more sustainable modes uh, more regularly. This is our city car project. So if you, if you look carefully, you'll see it has some interesting features. One is that we've moved all the complex mechanicals to the wheel, what we call wheel robots. So each wheel has a drive motor, steering motor, braking, suspension. Uh, that allows us to get rid of these otherwise useless things like engines and, and drivetrains and transmissions that allow you to, to fold the vehicle. So that's one. You've got robot wheels. The second is that it's all drive-by-wire, like a, like a modern aircraft. There's no mechanical linkage between the control and the, uh, and the, uh, the steering mechanism. Uh, it folds, so it can occupy a very small footprint. In this case, it folds to be as long as the width of a conventional car, so you can go nose in on the curb. You can get three to three and a half vehicles in a conventional parking space and the front door opens up. There's no foot pedal, so you step directly out. It can even crouch down if you're an elderly person. So everybody thought this was uh, one of our wacky Media Lab ideas. This was a project Bill Mitchell uh, started over 10 years ago. Here you can see the yoke. See, it pivots left and right, so you can use it in Paris and London the same day. And uh, one of our sponsors has licensed this. They're now going into crash testing. They kept all of the features. We thought they'd probably dumb it down a little bit, but they really believed that these four elements were, were essential. We launched this last year at the EU headquarters in Brussels. That's the president of the EU. They cited this as the great social, innovent, uh, social innovation example involving uh, European-US uh, collaboration, so we were we had a lot of fun at that opening. This is our sponsor giving me a thumbs up, okay, because we like happy sponsors. We like working with industry because that's the way you get this out into the world. All right, so the City Car Project is, a, is an archive project, okay? That's been launched out into the world. We're now doing a 2.0 version of it, and it will be autonomous. So we think this is the future of cars particularly urban, urban vehicles, where you combine three elements. You, you combine autonomy with car sharing with electrification. Now, that's a very powerful combination. And we think this is what will allow um, car sharing to actually take off in cities. So one of our students said, well, if you have all these driverless cars going around the city 
and you walk in front of one, there's no human to make eye contact with, maybe the car actually should make eye contact with you. It needs to signal its intention because there's no human to do that. So we built this autonomous vehicle testing array that will allow us to look at these issues. And I, what I love about this particular project is this is not a problem in the world yet, but it will be within five years. And so we've now had um, a number of auto companies that have taken these ideas, and, and uh, this is a half-scale prototype. They've now integrated them into full-scale cars, and we're, we're working with a number of car companies. Now, if you have uh, autonomous vehicles, and by the way, I don't really, I don't think the Google vision of autonomous vehicle is, is really the future. I think it's more autonomous pickup and charging and storage, which is the great benefit of it. I don't care if somebody drives. I mean, eventually nobody will drive because humans are really dangerous. But in the short term, you would call for a car, it would come to you, you drive it to your destination, you get out of it in the middle of the street, wherever you want, and it goes on its way, prepositions itself for somebody else, robotically charges itself. And at that point, no rational person would want to have a car in the city because you don't have to deal with parking uh, or insurance or maintenance or, or, any, or, or um, charging or any of those issues that we, we really shouldn't be thinking about. But ultimately, this is what you get to. So when you have full autonomy, you can get rid of conventionally designed streets, you get rid of all traffic signals, you, you essentially get rid of all congestion, and you get rid of at least 90% of the accidents. And um, everyone we've talked to in the auto industry thinks fully autonomous vehicles will be commercialized within 10 to 12 years. I think we can get to the shared use autonomy in, in cities within five. Uh, so the third uh, innovation we're thinking about is, is analogous to that, but we think of it as living space on demand, hyper-efficient apartments that are affordable, fun, and productive, particularly for young professionals in the city. So this is Mayor Menino, you all know, Mayor Bloomberg in New York. Both are advocating micro units to, to lure young people to the central city. The, the, the problem the cities have, the creative cities where, where there's the most innovation, is they need young people. They're the lifeblood of the city, but they're pricing young people out of the market. And uh, one way to deal with that is to loosen up the zoning and let um, developers build more housing. And I think that will happen if we can show that we're not increasing traffic congestion. The other way is to make smaller units but make them hyper-efficient. We think you could, we, can, um, we can make housing where a, an apartment half the size of a conventional apartment is much more functional. This is uh, an old video, but I still show it because it shows how you can dynamically transform a space from... Uh, living to working, your employees come in to a, a, a dining party, to a dance floor, a yoga studio, whatever. You, you use the same space and you dy dynamically reconfigure it. I used to th think a lot about mass customization and ways of having a supply chain with interfaces that allow people to configure thousands of different apartments. I, I finally realized that probably wasn't going to work. It's better to do a few very carefully designed technology-enabled furniture-like infill elements that can create multiple configurations. They, of course, can be mass customized. We're now working uh, with developers in Manhattan who intend to build a 36-story tower with these units. I'll just give you a few examples. So this is uh, an apartment where you see you have a king-size bed, a small living room, a dining table for, for eight people, and a study, you have a guest over, now you have two bedrooms, you open the, the space up for a party. Few simple uh, interventions. This is uh, an early study of how the uh, bedroom is expanded. You see the dining table there, and at night the bed goes up, the wall comes forward. Very, very simple ideas. This is a little 315 square foot studio apartment where you have the living room set up for a uh, party for eight people, the bed comes down, now you have a nice big bedroom, the table comes down, you have a dinner party for 10 people, all in one space. So, architects have been thinking about these ideas for a long, long time. 
there are great prototypes out there, but none of them have been designed to be integrated into the design and construction process and the financial models that are used by market rate developers, so therefore they don't scale. We're, we care about things of scale. So we've been um, trying to do, work in two directions. One is to figure out what the developers can really use, and on the other hand, figure out how to make the most sexy, uh, fun, infill components that could be installed in the apartments. What that prototype was showing was how you go up to a wall and you have touch sensors and you just naturally move it out of the way. And uh, as simple as opening a door. This is a, an apartment that we built where we have people living where it's a very simple idea. We have four feet of storage. You can just slide it from one side to the other. You can get, uh, you, you double the efficiency. You don't need a, a walk-in closet. So in this one furniture package, you have storage, dressing, office, uh, even, uh, even a bed for sleeping. And what we found is that uh, the people that live there for a while, they sort of wonder why they can't move that bedroom wall out of the way and expand their living room. It's, it, it becomes, a, I think, over time, a very natural thing to do. Fourth uh, innovation we're working on is urban food production. I wasn't thinking about this a year ago. This is a new project for us where advanced urban agriculture delivers high quality produce and essentially solves the food security and water scarcity issues. So I like to farm. I have an urban farm in a little backyard garden here in Jamaica Plain in Boston. This is my harvest from about three weeks ago and uh, grow a lot of heirloom tomatoes. That's my dog. That's my Brussels sprouts. Uh, but this doesn't scale. You know, this is not a solution. This is not a solution. This large-scale industrial farming, tremendously wasteful of energy and water. So we have to find a better way. And, and if you look at cities, you've, it's, it's really insanity how far away the food comes in the supply chain. Uh, I think we have to do a lot better. So we're looking at new technologies. We're, we're looking at aeroponics. Aeroponics is, a, is very simple. It's sort of next step beyond uh, hydroponics where you have uh, the root balls you see on the right that are misted with nutrients. Uh, we're now built, this is uh, on the, the right, our lab. We're building a, a laboratory that should be functional within the end, at the end of next week where we're growing tomatoes and lettuce and peppers and herbs. Uh, and we're going to be testing whether the numbers we're getting from industry actually play out. Uh, but this is what they say. You can produce 97 times the produce in a given area of land, one story high. It uses 90% less water, 93% less CO2, 60% less fertilizer. And ultimately what we think we can do is take a building built for another purpose, skin a facade, maybe the end walls where you have elevator fire stair cores, and produce food locally very intensely. And our numbers show that maybe one square meter can feed one person. And so you can, you can feed many more people than, uh, than the building houses potentially with this technology if it plays out. You can also do personal gardens. This is a prototype that we built last term uh, in the apartments. Uh, okay, energy networks is another thing we have to we have to deal with. Microgrids, locally produced renewables, etc. This is not a resilient energy network. This is Manhattan during the last blackout. India had uh, 600,000, 600 million people lose power one day recently. Uh, what we're looking at, I'm not going to get into any detail on this, but having resilient microgrids that are the, about that same neighborhood size that one uh, square kilometer, one square mile area, about a 20 minute walk, that becomes a microgrid such that it can be disentangled from the rest of the system. You have a, a problem here, you don't lose this node. A little bit like uh, the, the resiliency of, of the internet. And there we can have a DC bus, we can power um, the devices in a home directly with DC, connect renewable energy into it, connect electric vehicle batteries into it, use the, the used batteries and fixed energy buffers in the city. It all becomes pretty interesting. 
Uh, we're very interested in uh, new types of sensor networks to understand in a fine-grained way what's happening in, um, in buildings. This is our Media Lab building designed by Maki, where we've instrumented it with hundreds and hundreds of sensors. Where you see uh, a red symbol, the set point is higher, or the temperature is higher than the set point of the thermostat, where it's blue, it's lower. And we can find that uh, the control systems, even in this new advanced building, are not very good. Uh, we can also then understand human behavior. We even have Twitter feeds and all kinds of other things we can do. We're collecting all of this data. And the next step will be to make uh, more um, responsive networks. We, we are doing that in certain areas right now, particularly with lighting. This is our lab where we, it's a project with Siemens, where we have tunable LED lights. We have a sensor network. We're doing activity recognition. We're recognizing sitting at a desk, using a computer, et cetera. We're dynamically adjusting the color temperature and the intensity of the light. Blue light, by the way, is, uses 30% less energy than full spectrum white light. We like to do living lab experiments. So this is at the Sylvania headquarters in Beverly here, where we have people living with this every day. And as they go about their activities, the lighting dynamically changes. We, we can show that we save a lot of energy, but we're also interested in, in the, how, how receptive people are to these kind of environments. And, and of course, we're finding some people love it and some people hate it. So we're trying to figure all that out, and uh, it's all pretty interesting. In that case, she picks up the phone, the light goes red at the door to, sim to indicate it's not a good time to be interrupted. All right, so those are some of our solutions. I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we're doing now with all of this with City Science. So this is, this is our basic process. We've been analyzing cities, good and bad, and trying to um, evaluate them, score them, according to really clear metrics that we're establishing. Then we can identify the activity or the attributes of healthy, high-functioning cities. We know all these societal trends that we have to deal with, energy shortages, aging population, et cetera. We have all these new solutions, like I talked about, that we can bring to bear. What we're now doing is we're developing, in effect, a design hypothesis. So what is the impact if you can bring all of these solutions together? Then we're running a series of living lab experiments. So we're testing our hypothesis, or at least pieces of it, testing and evaluating, that's a, its own iterative circle. And then eventually, that will feed back and allow us to refine that design hypothesis. And we see this as a five-year program that we're just launching. And we need a lot of help with it. Uh, scale is something we really care about. So uh, I came to realize recently that we have all these solutions, we have all these ideas, a lot of people have a lot of good solutions. Uh, they're not finding their way into cities. So what do we do about that? I think as important as developing these solutions is developing a tool that allows for stakeholders and decision makers to make more informed decisions. Um, we're, we're now testing some of these ideas for a collaborative decision support system in this workshop we're doing now on Kendall Square. Um, and this is kind of what we're working towards. Um, some of you might recognize this from Avatar. And it was a, basically a decision support system where people stand around and a table and talk about very complex issues, data flows. Uh, in this case, they were trying to figure out how to kill people more effectively. But we think we can use some of these tools to help people design better. This is now what we call CityScope. We're using Legos to rap rapidly prototype the city. We're projecting information onto this physical model where we can simulate all kinds of systems. And you can see that people can now stand around and talk about them and discuss them. We have a whole array of video projectors. Uh, we only got this set up last week, so I shot this video on Friday. Uh, by the end of the term, we will have much more advanced uh, simulations. This is, uh, sorry, this is uh, an earlier 
prototype that allowed us to have confidence to proceed with the larger prototype. We see we're projecting onto facades. We're doing complicated 3D projection mappings to distort the, the image so you can uh, correct the parallax when you project at an angle onto geometry. We're doing shadow studies in this case. That's all being generated computationally. Uh, this is a, another prototype not designed for city design. This is Hiroshi Ishii's work at the Media Lab. Uh, this is um, kind of a baby step towards where we would like to go with our city scope. So we can, we can show dynamically changing information on a fixed model. We can add things to the model. We can scan it and update the computational models ultimately in real time, but we can't dynamically change the geometry. So this, this has a whole series of little pins that can go up and down, and what we're going to be working on this, this semester is, is, is applying some of our same projection mapping techniques to this dynamically reconfigurable schematic city. Uh, just, just to give you an indication of uh, what we're doing with uh, complex data sets, this is the work of my colleague Sandy Pentland. Every little dot that's moving is a mobile phone moving in the city, looking at nightlife behavior in, in San Francisco. So if you know where people are picked up, where they're dropped off, you know something about their profile, you can classify them into nightlife tribes that are color-coded here. And then you can map that back onto the city. And this is extraordinarily valuable data if you're designing new cities, designing new transportation systems. Uh, and uh, so here you can see those tribes map, map back onto the city as to where they live. Now, what you find is the people in each tribe don't only have the same mobility patterns, but they tend to buy the same shoes and the same cell phones. They tend to have the same diseases. And just, uh, just, this is just a hint of the kind of data that we can begin to assimilate when we think about uh, the design of new cities and all the systems that go into them. Ultimately, almost every city has this kind of a model, these, these uh, static, typically very expensive wooden models that show form, but they show nothing about the movement of people and the movement of vehicles and the movement of, of uh, data and energy flows. We think we can ultimately make these much more, uh, much more dynamic. So what we're working on now is we're trying to build a common open source tangible platform that has two purposes. It's a real-time data observatory and an urban invention, uh, intervention simulator. We then intend to form a network of affiliated cities where we can share all of these models and data and simulation tools and then uh, share these tested solutions as they are, <coughs> are proven. And these are all the different types of systems that we think we can ultimately simulate. So I think of this uh, city scope as a kind of a living laboratory. It's a, it's a way to study these systems, select the best ones then to test with people in urban living uh, lab scenarios, collect that data, feed that back into the simulation models, and then ultimately Maybe we can design cities using a data-driven process based on evidence rather than just instinct, the way we do it today. Thank you. A fantastic uh, uh, cornucopia of yeah. urban innovation. Well, city car, it's just one, one tool right. that we're using. I mean, we love cars. We love to design cars. But, you know, uh, the car company starts with cars. Right, right, right. You know, we, we, we want to start with the city and the needs of people and then design cars when it's appropriate. Right. Well, I think it was, that was really clear um, that, you know, one of the, um, we've been using several words as, as the kind of common, the common glue that connects mm -hmm. people who do wildly different things as we've been going uh -huh. through this course. And obviously one of them is context. And what is the context for your, 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 your actions or your project or your enterprise? And another one is question or yeah. slash problem. Yep. And in both of those cases, um, you guys are really redefining um, the nature of the problem, and, yeah. which I think is, is, is... We're trying to. 
Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's really interesting because it is, you know, to take just a step back for a second, I mean, this is, gosh, in many ways, this is exactly what universities ought to be doing because the market is really good at solving uh, a specific problem for which there is an extant Absolutely. and defined market. Absolutely. <laughs> um, one doesn't have to be an ideologue to say, you know, no, they're really good at that. If there's money to be made uh, making an iPhone, they'll, they'll make it. Yeah. But that's actually maybe a fruitful point of entry for, for conversations about not only the city car but about the, the rest mm -hmm. of it because the idea, first of all, the idea that people are making big cities from scratch mm -hmm is in a way only recently, uh, in our lifetimes anyway, um, a problem that needs solving. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, I mean, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, how many conversations were you or I privy to that where people said, well, um, we're going to build a city of 10 million people from scratch? Yeah. yeah. I mean, there were a few new town projects and, yeah. you know, little you know, steps in that direction. But now, go to China, and there, there is this vast greenfield area. I was there a few months ago, city between Hong Kong and Guangzhou, mm -hmm. where they will likely, within five years, have several million people living right, there. And right. they are starting from scratch. And I have to tell you, they are getting almost everything wrong, mm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think they, it's not that they don't want to do the right thing, it's, it's that... Um, they have architects that come in and say, I have the answer. They have the IBMs and the Cisco's sure. that say, we have the answer. Right. They have the Overups that say, we have the answer. And everybody has a piece of it, but the, I, I think they're totally overwhelmed. They don't right. know how to put all this together in a, in a holistic way, right. and they're floundering. Well, first of all, I have some sympathy, um, yeah. because the idea that, you know, I mean, in, in, in most of the West, um, many of our cities are either 50 or 100 years old or 500 right. or 1,000 years old. That's right. And so we have had the um, liberty, the freedom to, say, spend inordinately large periods of time thinking about comparatively small interventions, mm -hmm. right, modifications right. Uh, to cities. I mean, even things that we think are a big deal, like, I don't know, the upzoning of midtown Manhattan. Yeah. or the, expansive, the explosive growth of the West Loop area in Chicago mm -hmm. um, are blips on the radar of a Chinese uh, urbanization enterprise, which is at a scale 100 times yeah. anything that we know. Yeah, exactly. And, and um, if <clears throat> it wasn't apparent from what I was uh, presenting, um, European cities, and actually many U.S. cities, have tremendous advantages. Mm in that they evolved before the car. Sure. So I, was, I spent last week in, in Amsterdam and Copenhagen. And um, they're beautiful, they're beautiful infrastructure in the central areas mm -hmm. where the neighborhoods and mixed use, they're walkable, they're, they're um, designed for bicycles, they're cheese shops and mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. little cafes on every, every corner. But then as you get out at the edges, mm -hmm. The parts of the city that were designed after the car, it all breaks down. Right, right, right. And it's very interesting. So the new cities don't even have that core to build on. Right. It's, it's uh, I, I, I agree. I mean, uh, one sees it everywhere. We, it's easy for um, Western travelers to go to Paris or London mm -hmm. or Amsterdam and think, wow, this is really, they really have it together. Mm -hmm. And they do in that they're building on often medieval infrastructure that was necessarily governed by those yeah. uh, circles yeah. uh, on your maps. Uh, but they're actually no better than we are once they get outside no, the, the, because the car, is, the dimension yeah. uh, right. and, and distance issues made possible by the car the, change The everything. difference is that they, they have a greater appreciation for those values, mm. those values of higher density walkable right. cities. And I think what I'm finding now is they're realizing that there was a period starting in the, particularly after the war, mm -hmm. where they they kind of blew it mm. at the edges, mm -hmm. and and I think they're starting to create more walkable communities even in in the newer parts. The problem in China, they don't have that relationship, right. Right. and they're just so car crazy. 
Well, I mean, a lot of things are, you know, as I like to say in the operation of our school, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. Yeah. And, you know, on the one hand, and not to dwell on China, but on the one hand, there's rapidly growing um, economic uh, wealth. Right. And, and the middle class is emerging from yeah. nothing, from in one generation, from farming to to buying Audi A6s, even, even if there's 100% tax on them. That's right. <laughs> um, and... So, I mean, this is, and by the way, this gets to a little bit of the question um, and, and the context, if you want, for this conversation is a bit on the car side of things only because we had Henrik Fisker before and, and it makes for such a beautiful juxtaposition mm -hmm. in terms of the same, apparently, superficially, the same task at hand, mm -hmm. moving somebody mm -hmm. in, a, in a container that only holds two or three or four people, yep. um, or let's say two, because mm -hmm. most cars that Henrik Fisker would design would, would contain two, yep. uh, <laughs> probably one. Uh, and I think in most cities, the, the average occupancy of a car is about 1.4. Uh, it's, it's, you know, borne out in all of our yep. experience. No matter how giant the vehicle is yep. um, on the highway, you look over and, and there's one person in it. Exactly. Um, well, one of the things we, we um, started to talk about when Hendrick was here, um, the, the, the fundamental change in the nature of the problem mm -hmm. between something like the city car as part of a network of infrastructure mm -hmm. that really doesn't have any individual, it does not map any of your identity as a person mm -hmm. onto the way you're getting to the hardware store. Well, I'm not sure that's true. Okay. Because uh, we we think of it more like a, you, know, you know like a mobile phone, mm -hmm. so you have a you have a standard piece of hardware, but everybody has it personalized. Yeah, well that's they true. They have a unique set of apps, and um, in fact we've talked with the car companies in a sh with with shared vehicles. How can you allow for some, Cust some meaningful level. customization? Right. I right. mean, the, the, certain things are obvious. You can have all your music there and your waypoints for your GPS. You can have the seat and mirror positions. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, ultimately, with, with with new materials, new displays, um, you know, dynamically uh, configurable finishes. Right. You know, you might actually be able to have your cute little pink, uh, right. you know, vehicle. You know, how did you is, know? How did you know that's what I want? Well, I just assumed. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and whatever. So I, I think that that's a, an interesting question. I mean, I'm not sure how much people want to have that level of personalization. That's an interesting research question. I know they want some, right? But um, but I think there's so many things that are possible if the market is there. You know, this is super interesting because actually, what seem might seem like superficial differences in the presentation on the city car mm -hmm. struck me as very meaningful. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example. Is the number one? Is this a vehicle that I own, mm -hmm. um, or um, number two? And you, you got to it when you when you spoke a bit about the the sort of let's say five years out level of, autom yeah. uh, uh, of autonomy of autonomy that I might um, call for a car and it would come yeah. driverless to me. Yep. I would get in it, drive it where I needed to go, and then just get out and it would go. Yeah take care of itself. Now is the idea about customization it, at that point in the continuum that cars could actually be customized when I get in them. I have something with me. Oh, that, something. Yeah, well, yeah it would know you. Yeah, it, know, it would just it would just morph to fit you. So the mass customization is. isn't about me owning one. No. It's about while I'm in it, it's one way See, and while would, you're in it it's another that's way. That's right. We really care about dynamic transformation right, and right, customization. Right. That's what technology allows. Right. You know, architects are trained, I was trained to think about the optimal solution for a given problem on a given site, and it's going to be perfect and stay unchanged right, forever. Right, right, You know, a few people were thinking about movable things. Khan actually, when he designed his art gallery in, uh, in, in Yale? In, uh, Yale in New Haven, the first one, yeah. he, he had these movable partitions, and he decided they always screwed it up. Right. So when he did the Yale Center for British Art, he made everything fixed right, because right, he didn't right, want right. people messing with it. That's a really good and point. And I love Khan. He's probably my favorite architect. But I think that is not, that's not the solution for most problems. Right. That's right. the solution for an iconic work of art. Sure. Where you don't want, where the artist doesn't want the, you know, right. somebody to mess with it. So I think there's no reason why that little vehicle can't transform to fit you perfectly. 
Right. Well, this seems in a way like the logical and technologically driven um, answer to efforts at prototypes, modern prototypes early in the modern movement, where yeah. there was a, 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 the idea of a, of a single form that might be usable um, on different sites in different conditions. And yeah. of course, actually, that's what um, architects don't love it, but that mm -hmm. is what is true of much of our housing, much of the private housing that's yeah. built in this country is uh, I, variations on various types. I would types. put it a little stronger. I would say 98%. Yeah. That's right. the quality of the housing. Right, right. But archi what architects work on is almost irrelevant. No, I, I, you, you, get, you know, have no argument here. Right. Um, um, I mean, I think what we're trying to do certainly is try to get our, our students, and, I, and I, I, clearly your students as well, more involved in the scalable possibilities yeah. of the challenges that the world actually has. So what I, I think in the end, with respect to architecture, what we are trying to work towards is to have the, the high level of design and engineering and response to the individual mm -hmm. that you have with one-off architectural right. design, right. but implemented at an industrial scale yeah. so everybody can benefit from that rather than a few rich people. Right, right, right. Well, this is, I, I mean, couldn't be more in agreement with this. Um, and for those of you who are not architects, this is a this is kind of a big um, distinction <laughs> that, and you're seeing, this is an unfair display because you're seeing two people on the same side of this issue. Yeah, exactly. In, and nobody advocating for the discrete you one of a kind. You find any number of people at, at the department in, at MIT who would be on the other side. I know, I know, I know. And that's, you know, yeah. uh, uh, and ironically, I will say, without getting into that issue too much, it is, strangely, it is for that identity, that of solving the discrete, one-of-a-kind, never-to-be-repeated enterprise yeah. for which architects are best known and valued, That's right. it, it, which is yet another contextual challenge. And, and I would say that has to continue, because mm. those are the buildings that I want to experience. Right, right, right. They, I, I, and um, I only get annoyed when people use that methodology and then pretend it's scalable. Right, right, right. Then right. I think they're completely off. Right. If you're, if you're, if you're uh, developing art, right, right. you know, go for it. Right, Don't right. pretend it's something else. No, well, well <laughs> you've just defined my problem with the uh, Barry Bergdahl curated exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art over the last six or seven years. Exactly. Um, I, I applaud the effort to get into more um, meaningful and, yeah. and, and, and realistic topics. But unfortunately, yeah. the, the methodology was to start with an artist and hope yeah. that the solution would turn out to be the right one. This conversation is perhaps a little bit inside baseball at the moment, so uh, <laughs> we, we can leave it there. Yeah. But, but I think this point about the evolution of, I mean, when I thought about your visit here, I was thinking about um, the very clear almost binary relationship between Henrik Fisker's um, um, very, I mean, very engaging and romantic uh, ideal about the car as an embodiment of your individual human spirit that gets you through the, you know, he, he spoke explicitly about how, you know, the feeling of individualism and power and authority mm -hmm. that you would have, albeit just during your commute to work, but then at least it would, that, that yeah. thrill would, would fuel you through the um, spirit-numbing conformity of the day, and then you'd get back in and get recharged on the way home. Um, <laughs> I mean, so that's one end of the spectrum of how one thinks about a car. And at the other end of the spectrum is this idea about infrastructure. But actually, when I see your presentation, it's actually much more complex than that. It's, mm -hmm. it's a continuum from sort of where, where this project is now to an even more integrated sort of networked mm -hmm. life. Yeah. And I don't have any problem with somebody having their Maserati in their garage that they take out on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And you know, and that's their that's their romantic connection and freedom and sure. you know, wind in the hair and all of that. Right. But I think it, that is uh, damn silly in a city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Used dated for day-to-day -day commuting. Well, to be honest, I, I, by the way, having, I've only been to uh, Beijing and Shanghai once, yeah. but uh, I will be taking some students back over again in 2014. But um, the business about the traffic is truly just, if anybody's ever complained about traffic in the United States, you don't know, 
You, you have is, not seen congestion until you've seen it. It is mind-numbing. I, I was in Beijing, and I, I, I had about um, eight kilometers to go for a meeting. I left an hour. Right. <laughs> I called the guy up as I get in the cab, and he said, this time of day, you need at least two hours. Right. To go. So we're canceling so our meeting. We're canceling our meeting, unless you <laughs> just take, like to take a brisk walk. Yeah. I'd probably the, beat the bicycle, the... I could have made it in 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. um, that's... that's that's great. Let's talk about the, because um, it's totally true, and by the way, Bangkok and some other places, I don't want to, I don't want people to think that China's the only place with insane traffic. Sao Paulo, um, yeah. you know, you name it. Um, as, your, as your presentation pointed out. Um, but on the, um, I mean, I hadn't tied together some of the things that you are working on, but you're very, you know, you're totally right. I'm, we're very connected with some of the designers and developers who are involved in the micro-housing yeah. enterprise here. There's a fellow named Kelly Sato who's doing a project with Ad Inc. down yeah. in Four Point Channel that's really, sure. uh, you know, for what actually gets built these days, it's quite innovative. Yeah. Um, but when you see this dynamic spatial thing happening, the idea that in a 315 square foot unit, and I don't know how big your, those of you who live in dorm rooms or suites, I mean, they're, 315 square feet as being the entirety of your apartment uh, as an adult is, a, is, is very, very, very small. Cool. But you showed that I could, I could have eight people over for dinner. I could, yeah. I mean, that's amazing. Well, the, yeah, the, I think the value proposition is a good one. Mm -hmm. You just can't engage in these activities simultaneously. Mm -hmm. That's the limitation. Mm -hmm. But in that little apartment that we have, the living room is actually, we used as a living room, is actually bigger than a typical developer's two or three bedroom apartment. Right, right, right. The dining table is typically bigger, right, the same right, thing. In right. fact, you have the functionality in that, um, when it's used at, in that configuration, right. that you typically would find in a million dollar apartment in a city like Cambridge. Right, 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 right. right, right. The only limitation is you have, to, you have to cycle through the functions rather than use them simultaneously. Right, right. Well, and the idea is if only one person maybe is living there, that's, that's actually not unreasonable. Well, and when you talk about energy, um, MIT is involved with a lot of energy-related research, and there's the MIT Energy Initiative, mm. raised a lot of money, uh, multiple hundreds of millions of dollars. And um, most, of the, most of the funding goes to increase, for example, the efficiency of a photovoltaic cell mm -hmm. by a half a percent or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Which is which is better for the planet? That mm -hmm. or building half the square footage right. per person right. with less embodied energy, less space to condi condition, mm -hmm. less uh, fewer lights, et cetera, et cetera. It's orders of magnitude more important, right. yet there is almost no money yeah. put into that kind of research by, and not to pick on MIT, it's the same with the Department of Energy, it's the right, same with the right. foundations. They tend to be very much technology driven. Well, sure, because, I mean, I, th I would say, because, I mean, I agree, this is a huge mm -hmm. issue. I have a, my friend Tom Fisher, who's the dean of the University of Minnesota, is very active in um, establishing the National Academy for Environmental Design, yeah. a, a nascent little uh, companion enterprise to the giant National Science Foundation or the right. or the National Institute for Health, but the idea that our the design of our environment, um, of the man-made environment, um, needs the same kind of critical attention, yeah. and yields maybe orders of magnitude better returns on that investment. I'm convinced it will. Yeah, and the same is true when you look at industry. So you have IBM doing mm. some very good work. Again, mm. not to pick on IBM. Mm. They go to a city like Rio, they put in this uh, really amazing control center where mm. they can look at, uh, they have all these data feeds, they can optimize traffic, they can look for uh, emerging problems. But of course, they're not thinking about how to get rid of cars. Right, right, right. They're not thinking about how to plan cities better, they're thinking about how to optimize systems and get a couple of percentage, right. you know, greater efficiency out of these systems. And there's no way a company right. can actually do that. That's just there's no business model. Well, for this it. is this is this is the core issue, and why another, um, you know, some of the things we're interested in in our school are one, the public review process, because mm -hmm. that in participatory democracy is actually the giant unsolved one of the giant unsolved 
problems. Yeah. But the other one is, I guess, well, I used to say market-driven types, but really what I mean is market-aware solutions. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm very interested in um, how you guys are aware of that. It'd be very easy in a university setting to say, well, our job is to come up with interesting ideas and then we'll figure out, or then somebody else yeah. will figure out. I and mean, that's actually what pure research usually is. What are you doing? Um, but, you know, you're right. These, uh, w with the exception of China, we're not actually uh, making these things brand new for the most part. Mm -hmm. we're, we're retrofitting is a far bigger market. Even as, as giant as China is, mm -hmm. retrofitting cities for car use, for density, for mm -hmm. unit type and so forth, have you guys, you know, I, I appreciate very much the Lego modeling thing just because it, mm -hmm. it is efficient and you don't get married to extraneous design issues too early, yeah. um, which are infused with ideology and, exactly. and the rest. Um, you keep it, you keep from putting on your high design hat until later. Until the appropriate time. Yeah, until the appropriate moment. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, have you guys thought about the... Many of the problems you're trying to solve, they don't seem, uh, I'm not sure how the market as currently configured supports them. In the European Union, there's simply a greater commitment to public expenditures so the city of Copenhagen can pay for yeah. uh, maybe a, 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 a city card network because yeah. they would say um, rather than taxing people for driving there, or, or we'll use the tax on people coming into the city center to pay for this so there's no net loss in functionality. Mm -hmm. But where, like, when it comes to the small housing unit with the, um, you know, that's, that, that is transformable, yeah. um, how much luck have you had with, you, you, you've got one? Uh, oh, we have multiple, yeah. No, I think uh, your question's a good one because there, a lot of what we're doing, there is no realistic prospect of getting funding from industry. Right. There's, no, there's not profit to be made on this. Why would made. I do it? And we, for that, we're looking to Europe. Mm -hmm. That's why I was just in Amsterdam. Right. We're, we're developing a research program with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the sad reality is in, in the U.S., we just don't do big things anymore. We don't right. spend public money. Right. You know, we have a political impasse. In Europe, they're, you know, they really are thinking about that. It's a much better place to prototype these systems. Right. I, I do believe, ultimately, that... Um, we will develop a lot of the solutions here because we're closer to industry. I'm talking right. about at the U.S. Right, right, right. European uh, <clears throat> research institutes, as you say, are really disconnected from that commercial process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, then, we'll probably prototype them and test them and perfect them in Europe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But because they're not building new cities in Europe, they will be deployed <laughs> at scale in China. <laughs> and right. then when they figure out the business models, they'll sell it back to us in the U.S. Right, right. I think that's how it will happen. <laughs> but um, but with, with the, the housing, for example, there is, a, there is a, a really solid value proposition for developers. In, in the U.S.? In the U.S., yeah. and, and mostly because of my TED Talk, right, which right. a lot of people have seen. I have a lot of developers that have called us, and we're now working. We started a, a startup. Uh -huh. to commercialize this right, because right. we were just getting too many requests. Right. And, uh, and I hired the uh, PhD student that did the city car right. to now work on the transformable housing. And by the way, it has proven to me that uh, a typical architect's firm could never do this. It's just too much work. You can't do it with the fees you get right, right. for an architecture you know, project. And a, a typical uh, manufacturer wouldn't do it because they don't understand the problem well enough. Right. So we decided to, to, uh, to commercialize that. We are now negotiating with an entity in Beijing and in Helsinki. Hmm. And uh, we have a, a current agreement with New York and a lot of others that have projects underway that I think when, you know, these, these things take two or three years, when, at the right moment we'll, we'll step in. And there's, I, I am not worried about that. We can make that work. Yeah, that's so interesting. So um, the there the idea is to um, work with different partners in different locales, but try to yep. develop the same basic prototype? Uh, 
the idea is that or we the have, systems the prototype. we have the we have the mechatronics that we that are absolutely standardized that will be fabricated in China. And these are these are the easily con the very easily controlled moving walls. Yeah, and so well, forth? we have the walls that move. We have the beds and the tables that go vertically, and then we have a few other things that we're, mm -hmm. we're working on. But those are the the basics. We're using really robust technology like motors designed for garage door openers mm -hmm. and sensors, you know, <laughs> right, where right. they're literally making millions of these things. Right, right. And they run for cycle, they cycle for years and years robustly. Uh, but then, we, then you can wrap really anything around it. Mm -hmm. You know, any, any kind of furniture, you, could, you can use, you know, titanium or veneers or high end, low end, it doesn't matter, but we would have the standard mechatronics. They could be put in micro units, they could be put in very large apartments to do more dramatic right, transformations. Right, right, right. And we're just having a lot of fun seeing the potential of it. Mm -hmm. we're, now, we're now working on an, uh, an apartment in uh, Helsinki where we're introducing saunas. That mm -hmm. was a whole other thing. I'd never really worked with saunas. <laughs> well, now, the and sauna then, and remains... We're, and we're building a transformable sauna, because it's silly to have a sauna that's a single-purpose right. space when you only use it once a week. So what are the other... Like, on the, Does it have the traditional wooden interior yeah, look? Yeah, yeah. Well, so, we're not finished yet. But okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, all right. It, it will. That's the idea. It will, have, it will convert to a traditional wood sauna, but then things fold down for other functionality, right, like right. laundry. And, right, you know, right. So. Well, I was... you know. You, you know, as an architect, you can probably imagine where I was immediately going. Okay, well, now what is the other, like, we've talked in this class a lot about how one of the best metrics for great design, mm -hmm. one of the most consistently reliable metrics is that it solves more than one problem exactly. at a time. I mean, I, I can't think of any good design of almost anything yeah. that doesn't do that. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's really cool and it solves like five things at, with, the, with one That's move. Right. But um, so naturally, when you say uh, you've got a sauna, I'm imagining a small, light-colored wood okay. enclosed place, yep. and then okay, now one of those wall slides away. Is it is it like a fireplace? Is uh -huh. it a, yeah, okay? We're going to hire you as a consultant. <laughs> we'll work it out. <laughs> we're just getting we're just getting started on that. But actually, we've we've been very interested in pairings yeah, for yeah. transformation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we realized that we were trying to do too much at once. We were trying to you know, do five things with transformation. Mm -hmm. And what people really get is a seating area that converts to a bedroom mm -hmm. or a study that converts to a bedroom, you know, or those, those kind of transformations or one space that converts to two spaces. Now, you know, this is so, I, I'm so glad that you, you uh, showed us a broader scope mm -hmm. of your work because um, the, I, I, it, it does raise um, questions that are not only technical and not only policy, but cultural. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about the sort of networked life, all of the, you know, as you know, as we both know, yep. as dinosaurs, we know that these people are yep. incredibly comfortable with the fact that they're sharing music and they're sharing files and social media and everything as we speak. Those two people right there are probably chatting with they each are. other. They're they're chatting with, they could talk their, to each other, but why not? This way you'll have right. a record of it. So that's good. Um, but but as we start to share more and more things, as more and more becomes infrastructure, right. um, I, my identity is now not tied to my car, uh, you know, whether it's my F-150 or my right. Prius. Um, yeah. I'm just part of a, a system. And when my apartment, this is where, I, where I'm going with this, when there is a really well-designed, vaguely IKEA looking in the sense that it's you know, it's affordable, but it's well-designed. Um, and I live in one, and you live in one, and, mm -hmm. and he lives in one. Um, how much of, uh, you know, certainly leaving some areas to be modified by the user must be an essential part of this calculus, mm -hmm. right? Because especially, it seems to me, when it comes to a home, much more so even than a car. Look, at sometime I'm going to pull up to a stoplight in my red Mustang, and uh-oh, bad timing, you're pulling up to the stoplight in red Mustang. We, we know that there are others out there. Whereas our home, we tend to like to think we have completely uniquely customized, even if we bought everything from mail order operations. Mm -hmm. How do you, do you guys talk about that at all? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think with everything, whether you're talking about a home or a, or a city, mm -hmm. it, you have this top-down 
infrastructure that has to be really carefully designed. Mm -hmm. Think of it as a great um, score for a piece of music, mm -hmm. jazz lead sheet. Right, right, right. You know. And, you know, without that, it's really hard to do anything meaningful mm -hmm. unless you're a absolute you know, genius. Then you have this bottom-up innovation. You could right. think of that, that as the soloists that work with that jazz right. lead sheet. Right. Right. And I think City is the same thing. You have to get the, the infrastructure in the right place, but the last thing you want to do is to try to in anticipate the complexity of human behavior and how things will evolve over time. You have to create this agile infrastructure that can evolve over time that takes advantage of all the creative activity of people that will live there. Right, right. And finding that line is really hard. And architects are control freaks. Right, they right, want to do right. everything. Right, right, but right. then you have this whole movement out there of this bottom-up co-creation, right, open right. innovation, thinking that everything can just evolve. And I think that's equally bogus. Mm, it mm, has mm. to be some, some balance there to, to get it right. The other, the other thing we think, that's one level that we think about it. The other, the other thing we think about is this transformation in people's attitudes about stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, think, uh, I think the most primitive... The sharing economy. Yeah, the most primitive is, is the ownership. Right. I want to own all my stuff. Right, right. There's something, you know, you know I want to gather it in and hold on to it and not let anybody else get it. Right. I think that goes back to really primitive times. Right, right. Then we're moving towards a sharing economy where people are re realizing that it's really about the service and the functionality and we should share things because right. it's not really efficient because it's good for society but it also makes my life a lot easier because mm -hmm. I don't have to think about parking the car. And, and makes it more affordable. And I, makes it a lot more affordable. I don't affordable. have sunk costs in every right. thing in my life even if I only use, that's right. use it a little bit. But that's still pragmatic. So I think then the next step is to think about the experience. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's it's not the efficiency of the sharing that's as important as creating really rich experiences right. for people. Right. Then I think there's one step after that, which is transformational. Mm -hmm. You know, it will make me a better person mm -hmm. and transform my life by having these things. Now we're we're still down here in the somewhere between the sharing and the the experience. We haven't gotten to the transformational yet. Right. Right. But uh, for example, if you can have this. You know, um, these design solutions and technology and all the stuff that we can do in your apartment and it allows you to live five years longer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, keeps you independent and connected with life until right. you're 110. Now, that would be transformational. Right, right, right. No, that's, that's, so, that's so, so true. And so the, the borders of uh, the sort of the, the era that we're in are sometimes hard to contemplate in this way because um, it's easy for everybody to recognize, yeah, technology is advancing. You know, yeah, now I have a cell phone that's really a massive computer in my pocket. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I can customize it to make it look pretty much whatever I like. But somehow we are always able to talk ourselves into the fact that that's, that's just normal. Yeah. Well, whatever normal is now is, 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 is fine. But, but I think your point about the... Um, uh, moving towards the transformational, but even just the, the penultimate step, is really, uh, you know, we are, it's funny. Uh, uh, as a nation, if I could say, I think we are totally confused about our relationship to progress at this moment, we are. especially. In other Absolutely. words, because the progress, what happens if it's in some of these directions that use politically dangerous words like sharing? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we like it. We like innovation and advancement. Yeah. But uh, I remember George Bush? He was talking about the ownership society. Yes, 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 yes. Well, you know, and there was a lot of. I mean, uh, and it resonated. I mean, yeah, of uh, it, did. It, it resonated uh, because the alternative was just renting. Was just renting, or yeah. you know, or uh, parallels were: uh, uh, are you autonomous or not? Yeah. Um, exactly. And and. It's just uh, these the, the influence that these devices and that these changes are going to have on the larger context to sort of zoom back out to that, mm -hmm. I think is significant. I, one thing that I'm looking forward to but have not yet seen, and maybe you'll tell me that th you guys have already solved this problem as well, but um, at the large, not at the scale of the designing a whole new city, but actually at the intermediate scale of 
when you talk about micro units, mm -hmm. one of the really smart things, first of all, it is, of course, a market-ready solution to a problem. If we can't make real estate in New York, Chicago, Boston, San Francisco cheaper, if it's, yeah. if it's finite and we just can't seem to build for less, uh, well, then how about let's make smaller units? So that, that, like, that passes the immediate smell test of being a good idea. Yeah. Um, but what isn't clear yet, it seems to me, is the urban design of, it's not an impossible problem by any means, but it is a, it, it is a bit of an issue when we have parcels that are generally a given shape in most of these cities, mm -hmm. and there have been building types that have emerged that have a certain logic to them, that is how big a chunk of each floor is dedicated to a unit and therefore mm -hmm. how many kitchen windows there are and all the rest, mm -hmm. um, and egress and mm -hmm. all the rest. I mean, that's an interesting um, uh, design problem that springs from this innovation. Well, we're, so for these urban, I, I didn't have time to get into this because I want to leave more time for the car. Yeah, but yeah. I, I just showed the micro units, but that's only one piece of where we're going with what we think of as a, uh, a, new, a new type for, for, for cities, for you, particularly for young people. Mm -hmm. You'll have the micro units, mm -hmm. then you will have, um, shared residential space. Right, common Same, areas. Common yeah. areas, but um, they overlap with the work-related space, uh, and they're so, time-shifted. So you're talking you about real live-work. Real live-work. So then you have, and then you have the co-working, the, the innovation mm -hmm. hub, and everything that supports that. There may be a shared uh, electronics lab and right, fab lab, right, and, right, right. And, et cetera, teleconference facility. And, and we, we're looking at blurring the line between the, those facilities that are work right, and right. those that are residential. For example, you may, have a, you may have a teleconference facility that is just an incredible Super Bowl party space right, right, you right. Know, on the weekends. Right, why, right, not? Right. Why, not, why not merge that? And, and then, then it goes down to the uh, mobility hubs. Mm. These buildings should, it really should deal with your private life, your work life and how you get around, and all that should be integrated. Right, but now, I've heard, I mean, I've heard inklings of this, and it makes lots of sense, the idea of not leaving, I mean, the, a core tenet of the sharing society seems mm -hmm. to me to be, the way we do things now is incredibly wasteful. Mm -hmm. Let's just, let's yeah. leave, let's, let's stay in that early yep. part of the value chain first. That is, I own a, uh, I don't know, I own an, a riding lawnmower, say I don't, but let's say I, I, I did, and I don't use it, I really actually use it like, you know, six times a year or seven times a year, and it costs a lot of money, and it sits idle mm -hmm. for a lot of the time. That's an easy example, but there are other things you, you use even less, mm -hmm. and so I guess from what I read, there are a lot of opportunities now for people to share things like that, and why wouldn't, that, that is low-hanging fruit. That's that right. seems obvious. Why, I don't need to store it. Um, somebody will come by and deliver uh, riding lawnmower to you me, I'll use maintain it. Maintain it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a better in every way. Exactly. Um, but it, it's it's also um, you know that, so that, that's that's a major upside. On the other hand, when I think about when I hear you describe these, um, on the one hand, excellent, rational, uh, efficient, live work complexes. As an architect, I think, yeah, yeah, sure, that makes a ton of sense. On the other hand, I think, okay, well, now who's going to develop something like this? Well, I guess the first people who would do it would be like Google to say, we have got to be able to get young people to work for us in Boston or Cambridge because we can't have them leaving because housing costs are too high. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, I have a friend, Margaret Crawford, whom you may know, who, who wrote a, uh, she's at Berkeley now, um, she wrote a book on company towns. Uh, Scotia in Northern mm. California, mm. you know, 100 years ago. And the degree of control over yeah. employees' uh, lives, entire lives, they were, they lived, they, it was a logging, big logging industry place, and they're actually very dangerous. No. And, but they all had little cabins, and uh, they, I don't know if they got paid in company script or not, but you know where I'm yeah, going yeah, with sure. this. I mean, is there, is, is this yeah. something that gets discussed in these issues? In these well, we've, um, We've been looking at these innovation hubs, and we're, we're just beginning to really study them in some detail. And you can identify 20 or so around the world. Right. Kendall Square's one. 
they are almost all urban. Mm -hmm. The tech parks usually don't work, they're outside of town. The exception is Silicon Valley. Right, right. Maybe now, the most innovative one of them. Exactly. All. Right. Now, I think Silicon Valley is not urban because they, well, two things. One is there's enough, the companies are big enough that they can create their own little city. Right. That's what Apple's trying to do. That's what right. Google, I've been to the Google campus. They don't work that well, but they, they almost become a little city. Right. Still, Many people want to live in San Francisco, so right. they've been forced to have these big buses that are I've with the desks, this. and they've got Wi-Fi, so you sit there for the, for the trip, and you can actually do work because people want to live in the city. Right. So right. I think that uh, Kendall Square is a much better model if we could develop that, right. or um, the, the, their equivalent in London. In I Amsterdam. see. So, so you would, your, your, your point would simply be, look, they're already doing this in a suburban way, yeah. and the urban way is much better. The urban way is much better. I think most of the young people want to live there, yeah, where, I think where they right walk to the that. restaurants and the clubs and, 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 and everything else. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're right. Well, before we uh, go, I want to invite uh, any of our students to come up and uh, ask uh, a question on this Fabulous topic. We do not. There is. There are not keys to a city car under your chair. I'm sorry to report. Um, here we go. Okay, here, good. here we have a contestant. Good. Very good. Yes. Uh, hello. Okay. Perfect. It works. Um, so you spoke a lot about um, uh, new designs for. Uh, I guess ways of tackling. Get, get a little closer. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, cities issues. Um, have, is there anything that you guys are doing about uh, water or uh, like uh, septic systems? Yeah, I mean it's a good question. Uh, uh, well, I think we're already doing way too much. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I think as, a, as, a, as an administrator myself, when I look at what you guys are doing, I would say, let's can we? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, no, no. And I and I keep thinking, okay, what can we prune out? And I, I don't. I'm not ready to give anything up yet. Right, right. But anyway, we're dealing with water only with the with respect to the food pr uh, production. Right. And uh, I will be next month at, at at the King Abdullah Economic City, where let me tell you, water is important in a country that has basically no flowing rivers. Right. Right. And um, this is in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. And we think that we can get uh, urban food production down to the point where you're using 2% of the water that is used in soil-based agriculture, mm. which is extraordinary. And if you, and, and, I, and I would say the, the most um, egregious waste of water is with conventional agriculture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we tr tend to not work on problems where we think industry is already dealing with it. And there's a lot of good stuff out there about recycling water and septic systems and things like that. Let, you know, so I kind of let them do it. Right. But nobody's, nobody's developed uh, a system that can scale to feed 10 million people in a city with food grown locally. That's a, that's a really interesting right. problem for us. You know, I, I, would just, I would just add that um, you probably know the Chinese landscape architect and city planner Yu Kongjin, mm -hmm. he in China, which they're they're in eastern China, their water problems are not as severe as Saudi Arabia, but they are really severe Very because severe. the water tables has been Absolutely. have been plummeting as the urbanization has been going on, and trying to design these new cities yeah. so that they use way 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 or that they waste way way less water yeah. mm -hmm. is a huge enterprise, and so people are yeah. are working on that. People, People are, yeah, ab absolutely working on that. And by the way, 10% of the currently productive farmland in China has tainted soil. Mm. Cadmium, heavy metals from the pollution, and they have no control, so they don't know where the food comes from. Nobody knows what yeah. they're eating. Yeah. It, it, food security is a huge problem there. Right. I guess a really quick second question, I'm sorry, just came yeah. up. Within the next 10 to 20 years, do you think somebody or somewhere would have designed a way that we'll, that we'll be able to purify water? To efficiently, move. efficiently purify water. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm sure they will. Yeah, they're good. All, there are all kinds of ways to do that. Yeah. Yes. So, so, so you talked a lot about um, the different projects that you have going on and it seems like they're all really great projects. So when you have a project that's so far along in the design 
process such as city fire, mm -hmm. you already have working units, you know it's something that can definitely work. What sort of steps in the process still have to be taken before like, I see one of these drafts down the street? Okay, so well, we, we don't do any commercialization at MIT. We're a nonprofit, mm -hmm. but we have 75 corporate sponsors. Mm -hmm. And so these things get commercialized one of two ways. Either a sponsor picks it up and does it like what happened with the city car, or we start a company and do it outside of MIT. Mm -hmm. That's really it. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. so city car was a sponsor. The housing stuff is, is a spinoff. Uh, Ross Picard just spun off a company to deal with her uh, her, her sensors effect, effectiva effective computing. Mm -hmm. There's a Hugh Hare with his prosthetic device who started a company. So it's um, and those tend to be either faculty driven or student driven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we don't do it at MIT. Okay. Yes. Um, so I'm taking a sustainable energy course right now. One of our projects was we had to create our own carbon calculator for like mm -hmm. our daily lives. Yep. And it was amazing to see what a large portion of that was from our food being transported yeah. from ridiculously far Absolutely. places. And that map you showed yep. of the lamb coming from New Zealand is yeah. like, you can't keep doing that. So I think that project of, you know, the urban food coming much closer, that just has to be done because it's yeah. ridiculous right Thank now. You. Well, I agree. I, I, I'm not sure we're growing lamb on the facades yet, though. But yeah, <laughs> well, but we. But but I think you know. There's another point because I think if you can grow food right there where, where people see it and experience it, they develop a much closer relationship, and hopefully, we'll get people eating better, so they won't be eating as much meat. They right. they can see the you know the produce and, they, and it's fresher and higher quality. I, so I think education is a is a big part of this. Mm. Well, well. Well, I, I, I remain to this of, of all the many things that you've convinced me on today, yeah. the um, um, vertical exterior wall farming on high-rise buildings. We'll, we'll, we'll just let's we'll agree to talk more about it. How about that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's good to have a healthy degree of skepticism because I, I will not say right now that it works. Right, right, you right, know, right. But we're uh, in fact we had a meeting last night about it where there was a lot of skepticism about that, and I just said, look, we're just going to run with it and test it. We're going to, we're, so we're building a lab, we're collecting data, Right. we're going to see, we're going to feed the whole media lab, if yeah, it works. Yeah, there you go. And, uh, and see if these numbers that industry's throwing around are even close. Well, one, one thing that, that you, you your, even your slides suggested, which I thought was super interesting, was you know, when you showed your own yeah. personal uh, affiliation with your own garden, yeah. um, I've been involved in the public review process on a big new tower by Harry Cobb at the Christian Science. Yep. And one of the interesting and innovative things about this is it's going to have operable windows all the way up. Yep. Not, not everywhere, but there will be a yep. wind protected place sure. in every unit, which is pretty unusual. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. this is at, at 700 feet. That's yeah. quite yeah. unusual. Well, the idea that you could you know, modify the skin of a building to receive, and this is, I'm sure, probably already been done, but, but to rationalize and regularize mm -hmm. um, a small, highly productive garden space for each person yeah. is another, another interesting, it's interesting thing. Yeah. So the, the uh, aeroponics that we're working with, it has to be a sealed chamber. Mm. It has to be hermetically sealed. There are 27 variables that have to be manipulated. Mm. Um, you, 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 you can, in theory, dump the waste heat into the building, but, mm. you, but you, you have to have, you'd have to have a heat exchanger. Right, right, you know? right, right. And right. so it becomes very challenging as an, as an engineering problem. Right. You need to, you, they can easily overheat, and so you have right. to have uh, louvers that control the light. They can get too cold in the winter, right. so they have to be insulating. And whether all that works out, I don't know. Right. But, well, most of these people are not architects, so they okay. don't know that um, one of the biggest challenges in high-rise buildings is not um, heating them, but keeping it's them from getting too hot. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. but here, we've got some more uh, questions. So, uh, my question was I a little this, bit. I think this guy's working better no, over well, here. Well, I think they got That's them both all they got. Okay, good. So, my question was a little bit more about the urban agriculture. You were mentioning before something about using less CO2. Yeah. And isn't that something you want to avoid, where you'd want to be actually pulling in more of it in an urban environment to actually rid that environment of greenhouse gases yeah. like that? Yeah. And well, is there something you could do to kind of alleviate that? 
Yeah. Well, they, what 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 you're doing is you're re, it's a sealed chamber, and you're recir you're uh, recirculating mm. a lot of this, and you're you know you're 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 blowing CO2 across the roots, and you and and so. Um, but it's a good question because you know all the, you know we tend to think about green stuff in cities as actually consuming CO2, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and and I don't think this for it to work in a high tech way, you know, to get the right, kind of right. production levels would really contribute. In so in a way, sense. so in a way, it's a question about um, how you ask the question. I would say, in other words, it is um, rather than comparing. In a way, implicit in your question is, well, if we had the same amount of agricultural production in a traditional farming setting in the city, wouldn't it be performing this other function as well? And I think the answer to that is probably, you know, this is not, is yes, but that's not the problem he's trying to solve. That's right. And by the way, the, the CO2 is, is looking at the whole supply chain. Okay. That's, it's looking yeah. at the production of fertilizer and transportation and everything. Thank you. Right, thank okay. you. Please. Hi. Um, so I'm really interested in all of your projects, and I think they're really cool and really amazing, actually. But I have a question about, actually, two. One, about zip cars, since they already, like, exist, yep. and, like, in the cities, they're becoming a big thing. So I wanted to ask if you were thinking of, like, the same structure in the city cars and zip cars being similar, like you would mm -hmm. schedule an appointment or schedule, like, a... Yep pick up and everyone has their own account. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and the other question was about the like their, the produce making in the each city, like each person making their own or like the cities making locally their produce. If you are doing like drip irrigation, that I read an article about that it consumes less water with like having a tube and like little yeah. drops. Okay, good. Well. So Zipcar, Zipcar it w came out of MIT, and I know Robin Chase well, who started it. Zipcar is, I think, a, a first step in that direction, but its limitation is that it's uh, two-way. You have to you have to return it to where you picked it up. Mm -hmm. okay. And they would love, and I know the Zipcar people, the new people that run it now, and they would love to go to a one-way. One-way is really what you need in the city. You need you want to like hubway. Like, like, like Hubway, you go from A to B and you leave it at B. The problem with that is, is you have to redistribute the vehicles. Right. So what Hubway does is they send guys around with a truck and they load up the vehicles and they drag them around and they've got a little you know, list of how many vehicles or bikes they have to drop off at each station. That right. gets to be really hard with cars. Yeah. So uh, that's why Zipcar just says you've got to return it back. And so you can't, it can't be used for many right. purposes. Right. So when you get to... Um, autonomous vehicles, though, see, all that goes away. Your redistribution problems are, are done. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have, like Zipcar has parking spaces all over the city. That, that one of the limitations for expanding is getting a parking space. Right, right, right. You know, right. they're very, you know, they're hard. Uh, that all goes away. You can, you can park them under a bridge or in a basement because right. they can be in a central location. You can use, then use electric vehicles. You don't have to have a charging station at every parking spot and expect the user right. to plug the stupid right. little cord in. Right. You can have them then go to a central location and, and autonomously, robotically, or inductively charge, right. charge the vehicle. Uh, so I think that's, that's going to change everything, and I, and I would predict five years it'll happen because we're talking with Chinese companies who want to do that. That's so cool. Yeah, the second, uh, drip irrigation is great innovation for soil-based farming, but what we're talking about uses a tiny fraction of even drip-based water, um, drip-based irrigation water, you know, in this kind of a system. The problem is it has, is very, is, is very complicated. Uh, equipment, you have pumps, and you've got to regulate pressure, and you have to have sensors, and because, because you're blowing these nutrients, misting these nutrients, you get you can get an infection, and it'll just wipe off the whole crop overnight. So, <laughs> this sounds why, like this has happened. It, it has not to us, but it's happened. So, uh, and by the way, this technology was perfected to grow medical marijuana. So. Who says they're not solutions emerging exactly. from all sorts of exactly. opportunities? Exactly. So that's why um, I don't yet argue that that's the solution. Right. I right. argue that it's a hypothesis we're testing. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, 
I want to thank you so much for bringing us so many hypotheses and solutions. <laughs>